Hello, Darren with Bounce and Bella here. Lovely to see you again. Um, today we've got Matt with um, from Help with Hounds. Um, Matt is a dog trainer and behaviourist. He's um, a member of the Institute of Modern Dog Trainers um, and studied with the ISCP, which is the um, International School of Canine Psychology and Behaviour. Sure, that's a bit of a mouthful, but um, he managed to gain a level five diploma with distinction there. So awesome stuff, um, knows his stuff, um, and interestingly is an approved KAD trainer, CAD, um, which is Kids Around Dogs. Um, so that so he's helping kids overcome their fear of dogs. So um, it's going to be interesting chat. Um, I'm now going to attempt to um, get him to join with us. Um, and if you've joined us before, um, you know I've got a 100% fail record on this, so let's see how we get on here. Um, right. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. Request. Oh. I've invited. Let's see. Um, wait for me to do it. Oh, hey, Matt. <laughs> Hello. Brilliant. How are you doing? Yeah, good. You? Yes, very well. Um, you've broken my 100% fail record, which is... <laughs> There's still plenty of time, I suppose. <laughs> and, and you've stolen my whole intro, which I've planned, so... <laughs> oh, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Good. Oh, that's lovely to see you. Um, so I always start by asking a little bit about um, uh, about your background and how you kind of ended up where you've ended up because um some people kind of and it's pretty rare though some people straight from school or university and they bump they're into it um many of us i know i've had quite a life before i got into the whole dog dog thing um i think that's it's true for you as well isn't it i mean it is, you've lived a life first it is yeah for sure so um you can hear me okay darren i'm just checking before i start definitely yes um so Yes, yeah. So I, I grew up with dogs. I grew up with a lovely German Shepherd for about 13 years when I was a child. Um, Same as me. Yeah. Well, I didn't grow up that well. We've got Roscoe downstairs. Yeah. We had Sorrel before him. Before him. So yeah, German Shepherds for me too. Mm -hmm. Anyway, sorry. Sorry about interrupting oh, you. Yeah, immediately. <laughs> <laughs> um, but before that, we got her when I was around seven years old, I think. Uh, before that, I was absolutely terrified of dogs. Really terrified. And that came about because we were out for a family walk when I was probably three or four years old and I got chased by a dog and I completely did the wrong thing and I ran away from the dog. So obviously so not to. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Especially when you're a child. Um, but yeah, it just that, it, that put the fear of uh, yeah, dogs in me. And uh, it, because I ran, obviously the dog chased me but it just wanted to play. I ran around in circles. I ran around in about five circles <laughs> chasing me and the adults not really, uh, really, they, they didn't really know what was going on. Um, but yeah, that, that scarred me for a few years. Um, yeah. And yeah, then we obviously got our German Shepherd and then, yeah, like you say, before dog training, I don't think many people go straight into dog training as a, as a career. Um, but I, yeah, I worked in financial services for 20 years, so very boring. I won't talk about that. But a few, a few years, a couple of years ago, I felt like I needed a change from that. Um, so I started volunteering at my local RSPCA um, centre as a dog walker, just as a, something different to focus on. And we've got our own Labradoodle by then. So I've got a four year old Labradoodle um, who's a complete nutcase. But she's uh, she's well trained, obviously, but she's she, she's a lovely dog. And um yeah, I started volunteering there and um, I knew my first day there, I needed to, I just knew in myself, I needed to start working with dogs. So, just before, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. I had that pull and that, I think it was literally that night or that week, I signed up, I went on the internet, I spoke to a couple of people and I signed up for a, a diploma, like you say, with the ISCP. I won't say the whole acronym again, but um, yeah, with the ISCP. Yeah. Um, and I was very lucky because they were a great organisation, uh, very well thought of. And um, yeah, it was a great diploma to do and a great place to start. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's how I got into 
the start in the dog dog journey, if you like. Um, mm. I then, sorry, you're going to say something. I was going to just ask if it, and then you moved in towards the more behaviourist issues, uh, did you? Is that yeah, what happened? Yeah, yeah. so yeah, I finished my diploma. Um, then I started helping some clients on a one-to-one -one basis with behavioural issues. And whilst I did that, I did my IMDT, which you said, Institute of Modern Dog Trainers, which is the modern dog positive force free dog training um, side of things. So I did that last year and I was very lucky to actually shadow a local IMDT trainer as well um, to help him with classes. So that gave me a lot of really good experience there. And uh, yeah, then I started doing expanding into the more the training side of things. So now as a business, um, I do one-to-ones, classes, puppy classes as well. And uh, yeah, some Zoom stuff as well. Because obviously with COVID, I, I started my business at the beginning of COVID, which wasn't the best <laughs> best timing. <laughs> oh, well, it might have been actually, because it, could, it couldn't get any harder really. Um, no, but you were forced straight into online, I suppose, which some people who... If you're an established business and you're used to doing it a certain way, it can be hard to twist and turn exactly. counting. You've got the yeah, the good thing about just cracking on straight away. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I think a lot lots of people still they're not sure about the whole Zoom approach for uh, dog training. But it can actually work really well and has its benefits because obviously there's no distractions. Um and it can be a good way to communicate that training across. So, yeah, I started doing Zoom classes as well. Um, but, yeah, now I do classes. And like you say, this year, literally a couple of months ago, um, I became an, an accredited, if I can say it, approved uh, CAD trainer. So kids around dogs trainer. Yeah. It's totally full circle, isn't it? Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. As it really, really has. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so, so no, both ends of the scale. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you, do you use the uh, KAD much? Does that do you have to? Is that kind of part of your business that's growing, or does yeah. it come along rarely? Or what's the story there? So it's uh, like I say, it's a new part of my business, um, but. It's, it's something I'm really excited about. So Debbie Luckett, the founder of CAD, um, she's IMDT and ISCP accredited, accredited as well. Um, she's a lovely lady. She set up CAD. Um, I don't want to say a date because I'm not sure when she set it up, but I know it's pretty recent. Um, and she's now expanding that with lots of approved behaviourists and trainers. Um, and so it's an association which helps families... Uh, who have got children train their dog and basically live in harmony with their dog because it, with lockdown so many people have got puppies um, and bringing puppies into a young family home can be challenging on both sides you've got the children interacting with the dog so helping them overcome that and training the right way is yeah really rewarding actually and it's uh it is, for me, the exciting part is because I see them as the next generation of dog guardians. So my yeah. generation, um, I'm going to put you in the same category as me, Darren. I don't know how old you are. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying. <laughs> I'm, I'm older than a look, we'll put it that way. Let's, let's say our generation. Um, obviously, I think dog training, well, dog training, I know dog training has changed so much, even over the last 10 years, five years. Um, oh, and trying to move away from that fear-based approach um, and forceful approach around dogs. Um, obviously, we need to teach our next generation of dog owners, dog guardians, how to react, sorry, not how to react, but how to interact and mm. be with dogs. Um, and then that's just going to help this positive change keep going. Um, but yeah, Sorry, but yeah, it's very different for us growing up, wasn't it? It was, it was all kind of. I don't know if it was for you, but for me, our dogs, and whenever we went to anybody's house with dogs, it's always kind of. It was more of a domineering, you know, the old school, very much old school, and uh, um, 
so it's lovely to see that that change around now so if you look on the internet now there's a, it's it's all about positivity isn't it it is yeah. you know, for the most part it's about positivity and um encouraging dogs to do things exactly rather than to. yeah it is and but i think it has to also be approached in the right way as well um and the right message has to be put across so um like the the cad side the other part of the cad uh business if you like is helping children with their fear of dogs so uh, having a set protocol to overcome that and that's having a positive approach on the person side so it's it's um making sure that both we communicate correctly on all levels and like I say, it's just making sure we get that message across correctly. It's not just bribing dogs with treats. It's actually uh, looking at the overall picture, what's best for the dog and for the family as well. So, yeah, it's mm -hmm. kind of bribing with, with treats, which I think is oft often the misconception. Um, mm. It's an end product in mind. You're aiming to do a certain thing with them rather than just hoping for the best with a few treats. It, yeah exactly yeah yeah so um so an example might be um I don't know, like jumping up as an example so your dog jumps up which all dogs do and uh certainly all puppies do until they're trained not to but yeah the old school approach would have been say no or push them down or push them away um but for our dogs that's actually a lot of dogs that's pos possibly uh, reinforcement enough to keep doing it um it doesn't need to be a treat that keeps doing it we might be inadvertently rewarding that behavior so what we need to do is think of a way to coach a different behavior which will benefit the dog and the human so a way of getting four paws on the floor um and that could be as simple as a sit for some dogs. Um, but not every dog is the same. So I think that's the important part. And not every family is the same. So it might be a game on the floor. It might be a down or how to settle. Um, but yeah, but dogs will only continue to do things which they find rewarding. So if they find sitting really rewarding they're more likely to come over and sit because then they might get a treat or affection uh, rather than come over and jump because they don't get any interaction at all. Um, mm. So, yes, yeah, so it's thinking along them lines of uh, what's possibly going through our dog's head and why they're doing the behaviour in the first place and not just barreling in with a, a solution because it's always been the solution um and it's always been a sit because a sit stops the dog jumping up but which is often the good solution but it's not always the right solution um depends on the dog sorry it depends on the dog exactly itself. yeah exactly and it depends and that reward um what i mean what if we think why dogs jump up dogs when puppies are born, they have their first probably eight weeks with a with a uh, with their mum, and they spend a lot of time licking the mum's face. So puppies will then come into the new home, and they see humans, the new family, and they want to lick our face because that's what they've done up until that point. Um, mm. So really, they don't. They might not be interested in a bit of sausage as a reward for sitting. They actually might just want some attention. Um, mm. And uh, yeah. yeah, so that could be their reward. So their their reward might be just a belly rub or something. Yeah, or their favourite toy or something. Yeah, play with a toy or something like that. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. again, always a good one. Obviously, if they're playing, then that might heighten their arousal. Um, oh, yeah. So it depends on the dog. So if you've got a a, a mad, uh, madly excited boxer dog for example is it might not want it. It, might, yeah. it might not want to get the tennis ball out <laughs> yes. uh, but we might want to teach a slightly more calming uh calming behavior um so if we try and humanize it for example 
So Darren, I don't know what uh, we all eat, eat food as humans, um, but we don't all eat the same food. I love a bit of steak. I don't know whether you like steak or not, but but you, you might not like steak. There's going to be things that I like which you don't like. Um, so I might find that highly rewarding, a bit of, of, of steak. Um, so that highly valued reward for me ne might not necessarily be the same for you. So it, we have to find out what works for our dog. Um, mm -hmm. And obviously that can be breed dependent and, and everything in between. Yeah. So I feel like I'm just on, Darren. I feel like I'm just... No. <laughs> well, that's fine. That's, that's what it's for. It's not to hit, listen to me waffle on. Definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> Can certainly do that, but it's <laughs> not going to help anybody. <laughs> but, um, yeah. So yeah. So it's important that a dog uh, determines what that we listen to our dog, and the dog determines what that reward might be. So one I often talk to with my clients is recall, because if 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 our we just get sausage out every time for a bit of recall. Our dog might not be food motivated in the first place. Um, it's certainly, we don't want to use a fearful technique like or painful technique like a, a shock collar or anything because that just doesn't teach your dog what to do. It makes him scared of doing something else, i.e. running away. Um, so it doesn't teach him what to do, but... Yeah, that bit of sausage works really well with my Labradoodle because she eats anything, like most Labrador stroke <laughs> crosses. Yeah. Um, but, um, yeah, if you've got a, a Jack Russell that loves playing with his tennis ball, get the tennis ball out and use that as your reward for it. And you then engage that in a game. Because yeah. if we can tap into their prey drive, so chasing that, that prey, the ball... Uh, rather than just rewarding when they get back, that's even going to have a stronger, uh, a stronger effect on that training and more engagement, build that bond as well between owner and dog. And uh, yeah, if we can tap into that prey drive, which all of our dogs have, um, some certainly more than others, and depends very much on the breed which part they <laughs> they, uh, they 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 tap into. Um, so, yeah, some dogs, a stuffed toy might last a couple of seconds because they like, love dissecting prey. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, Worth a speaker up. <laughs> mm. but, uh, but some um, might just love chasing balls. And yeah, it, so it's finding. So it's different dimensions of the prey drive. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so you've got. Um, so, so obviously, with any dog, they've got that whole part in them somewhere. But if you've got a retriever, his his instinct is to go and retrieve and bring it in and bring it back. So maybe the tennis ball would be good. Um, but if you've got like a, a, a bulldog that's going to like rag rag something or like maybe rip it to shreds, um, it's yeah. Look at the terriers which might have been digging for and going down holes. It's very much looking at the breed and the dog, um, finding out what's best for them. Like obviously, a greyhound just focused on chasing small, fluffy things. Um, so again, chasing something small and fluffy is in his instinct. Um, so he's probably not going to engage in, I don't know, but uh, it might engage in a tug of war, but probably not as much as chasing. So it, it depends very much on the dog and their their past as well so yeah. where they've been brought up and their their backstory so yeah. um, does praise work as well then is that one of the um we talked about the uh, prey option there but i noticed with um with roscoe um he's not a big foodie particularly mm. um but praise he will He's just a glutton for praise for some reason. He just that will work for him. Trying to get if I what recall what worked for him was just constantly recalling and then just praising like hell when he arrives there each time and it was can't wait to get back to you. So yeah, yeah so exactly that attention. So he might just want mm. so 
yeah, that's like I say, back to that jumping up thing. A lot of it is around attention. So you don't necessarily need to get the treats out. Um, but yeah, praise can be really good. Belly rubs. Some dogs love digging. If you can work that into your training as well. Um, yeah, tug of war. My dog, as well as cocktail sausages, she loves, she loves, she loves the game of tug of war. So I'll always take a tug toy out on a walk as well. So, oh, so I see that makes sense. I see people out with tug toys and I'm like, it just makes no sense to me at all because Roscoe would just, he just look at you like you're mental, you know, and just wander off. But yeah, just the dog in front of you, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So if you can make a game of tug as a reward for recall, fantastic. Um, again, you're making that dog excited, so be aware of arousal levels and everything. But uh, yeah. but yeah, if you can get a tug toy and just keep that for recall. So I always recommend my clients um, have a unique reward for recall. So whether that is so when you obviously train your recall, um, I say obviously, but when you train your recall, um, you'll probably use a word like here or come. Or maybe a whistle. But yeah, if you pair that so your dog understands here means he's going to get a bit of cocktail sausage or mm. this tug toy, and he never gets that at any other time in his life. He only gets it when he, he is here and he gets that where you are. He's more likely to come running back uh, if he absolutely loves that reward. So that, that's where we look at rewards as well, like the hi hierarchy of rewards. So... Um, Stop me if I'm waffling on, Darren. But... No, no, you carry on. <laughs> so with You're the... not waffling at all, you. it's fine. So with the hierarchy of rewards, obviously um, we need to pay our dogs for the correct, for the behaviour that they're doing. So it's like me, if I humanise this as well, if I say, Darren, do you want to come round and clean my front windows? Mm. I'll, I'll pay you a tenner. And you, and you, you might, if you, if, if you, you might go, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll do it for a tenner. Uh, you probably wouldn't, but you might do. You come around and clean it for a tenner. And you do that a few times. And then I say, oh, can you clean, clean my neighbour's house windows for a tenner? It's just cleaning windows. It's the same task. But actually the house is twice the size. And I'm still mm. a tenner. So we're ask, I'm asking you for the same behaviour, but the the context is very different. So we're asking for something very, very different. Um, and yeah, so having our hierarchy of rewards really helps. So asking for your sit at home is very different to asking for a sit in the park when you're surrounded by dogs. So uh, distractions, yeah. There's better things to be doing than sitting for a cocktail sausage in the park. Precisely. Yeah. Nicely. Yeah. But if you're using that cocktail sausage for everything, yeah, it certainly loses its value in the park. But if you only use it for in the park, then it's going to hopefully keep its keep its value. So um, yeah, so I have some high level treats knocking around that you always use for that particular task. Yeah, and make but that make sure that's determined by your dog. So because we think uh, because I think cocktail sausage is high value or cheese is high value and they're very commonly thought of as high value treats my dog might hate cheese or your dog might hate cheese so we need to find out what he actually likes he might prefer a, a cheap biscuit um but yes finding out what he prefers and then adjusting our training and keeping them in our pocket accordingly and using them appropriately so yeah. Yeah, so don't so don't turn up to uh, don't train at home with some kibble, and turn up to a class with seven other dogs with the kibble. <laughs> because, You're expecting that to work. Yeah, yeah, yeah because like the, you mentioned that in, when we met previously that the uh, the kibble just doesn't work. And but luckily for us, the um, what was it? The, 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 are yours the bounce and bella the fish treats, the training treats that worked for your dog? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I discovered Bounce and Bella because um, my dog, this was before I become a trainer. So she's, she's allergic to everything, basically. 
Um, mm. And I was just Googling treats and yeah, I found the salmon and uh, potato biscuit treats. Yeah. And but she absolutely loves them. So she, um, they're her go-to treat. So they're what I use for everything other than recall, basically. Mm. So then when it comes to recall, uh, it might be a bit of cocktail sausage or it might be, um, she's recently discovered that she likes the venison nibbles as well. So, uh, <laughs> oh, nice choice. <laughs> I wouldn't, um, but uh, yeah, then biscuits, she absolutely loves them. And I, I, because my dog loved them so much or loves them so much, I started introducing them to my classes. And the amount of people now that just use them as a, what I'd call a, a, a lower value treat in class, and then they might get out the nibbles for the. Uh, Oh. like that yeah. hierarchy of treats exactly yeah but uh yeah they're, 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 they work wonders they've worked wonders with my dog and uh yeah my clients i think uh, i think i i think probably 70 percent or 80 percent of my clients are now converted to bounce and bella so you probably <laughs> <It's> <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> brilliant thank you very much <laughs> Yes, but, um, uh, we're kind of um, we're hitting the half hour mark, so um, we'll start wrapping up. But um, it's been really lovely to talk to you, Matt. Um, um, it's fascinating, actually, the uh, the old hierarchy of treats and what have you, and how how dogs are different, completely different, and how how they're all spun to anything. Um, so. Um, for anyone watching, anyone watching in the future, to get hold of you, Matt, the uh, best way is is it um, helpwithhounds.com. Is just go to the website and find all your details there. .co.uk, yeah. yeah help .co.uk, with... yes. Yeah. Quite right. Excellent. Right, yeah. brilliant to talk to you then, Matt. You too. I can't... Thank you very much. I've enjoyed it a lot. All right, then. Take care. I'll see you later. Bye. See you.